thank you all for coming. Um, I have been collecting stories about Ashland basically full time for the last five years. So I have a lot, hundreds of stories up here, but I do have a script with me to keep, keep me on track because otherwise we might be here till like two in the morning or something like that. Um, <laughs> so so um, we are going to do a little time travel through these stories, Ashland history stories. So I'm going to be taking you to 1929, 1893, 1909, 1913, 1927, 1890, and then the 1940s, 1960s, and 1990s. Okay? So there will be triumph and tragedy, humor and hauntings. A little, it just, it's, it's like a potpourri. Um, <laughs> Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so we are going to start. We are going to start with a story from 1929. This is some humor. This is the Ashland High School newspaper from January 18, 1929. And I was just looking through it thanks to the wonder of the internet. Um, and I found some jokes they had in there. So I figured, hey, you know, these are 1929 high school jokes, uh, <laughs> right? So uh, I thought you might find them interesting. So here's, I'll, I'm going to start and end with, with, a couple, with a couple of them. So here's, um, this is a kid named Everett Yo saying, Daddy, will you give me a nickel, please, if I'll be good and don't ask for it? Uh, and then next is the dentist speaking to patient Norma as he placed her in the chair. Do you want gas? Norma, yes, about five gallons. And look at the oil, too. <laughs> it's when cars were, uh, cars were still you know, a little more unusual in 1929. OK, you know there's Briscoe School right here in Ashland. So this one features Mr. Briscoe. Mr. Briscoe asks a, a student, was your brother home from college over the weekend? And the student, Wood, says, I guess he must have been. My piggy bank won't rattle anymore. <laughs> That's your high school humor, so, a, a, a selection of it. So um, now we're going to go to the 1890s. and learn a little bit about the Honorable Max Proct. Who knows where Proct Street is? Four, okay, okay. There, there, is a, there is a Proct Street in Ashland named after this gentleman. Um, it is uh, just, just very near Ashland Street, just to the east of, a couple blocks to the east of, of Southern Oregon University. So, the, his claim to fame, as far as I am concerned, is his peaches, his peach orchard. Um, he also was involved politically and other things. And um, so he was born in Germany, actually, in 1846. He came with his family to the U.S. when he was two years old. So you know, he was basically raised as an American kid. He joined the... Uh, the Navy on the Union side during the Civil War. Um, and later in his life, he was very active in the Republican Party here in Oregon, which was the anti-slavery party of Lincoln. Um, well, he moved to Ashland in 1887 and uh, bought land and um, immediately planted a peach orchard up the hill f above the boulevard, <laughs> which the boulevard didn't exist in 1887, but it did exist in 1888. Um, so he planted, and it was basically all or almost all orchards uh, up the hills, up the hill from just the very small downtown area of Ashland. Um, well, Ashland 
I mean, now the Rogue Valley, of course, because of Harry and David, became known nationally for the pears here in the Rogue Valley. Um, but um, peaches and apples were the main uh, the main crops, along with along with others, and there were railroad cars full of them being shipped out the country um, in the eight, 1890s, early 1900s. So here's a um, his peach peach box label, Peach Below Paradise Orchard was his orchard name, and. I'm going to read to you from an 1897 essay in the Overland Monthly magazine talking about Oregon fruit. Uh, quote, in this connection, the fact may be noted that the largest apple, the largest pear, and the largest cherries exhibited at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair were grown in Oregon and that a special gold medal was awarded to Max Proct of Ashland for the largest and best flavored peaches. In other words, he got the medal for the best peaches in the country at the 1893 World's Fair. Um, this is his orchard. Unfortunately, the only photo that I have been able to find of it, it was in the winter. <laughs> so the, uh, the trees are, are dormant. But um, there's his house. And I was trying to track down. I had heard that his house still exists. So I was trying to, I was walking up and down Proct Street trying to track it down. So take a look at the, uh -huh. just the very top of the one, the, that's a 1910 photo or 1900 photo of his orchard. And then look at the very top of 660 Proc Street and you'll see that they match. You know, there have been, it, the house has been remodeled and added to probably multiple times over the last 123 years. But um, there it is. Is that new Euclid or do you know? Proc yeah, it's, it's, yes. Yeah. Yeah, big. Um, so, um, yeah, that, you know, just that's one of those things that I get excited about. You know, just finding a little bit of history uh, coming into the, our lives in the current day. Okay, we are going to 1909 next, and a, another story of um, a highlight of Ashland history when the uh, natatorium, is that a word that, that uh, it's a very unusual word. We don't use that word anymore. It's the swimming pool. Oh. But in the old days, it was the natatorium. Um, and Ashland opened a huge natatorium in 1909, that location is right where the Ashland Food Co-op is now, at the corner of A Street and First Street. There were two large swimming pools, one for men, one for women. There was a big water tank covered, with a, covered by a maple wood dance floor. There were balconies around, above and around the two swimming pools that according to the newspapers, had room for 500 people to mingle and watch their kids or, or have, have uh, events and parties and stuff. So I'm going to read to you from the Ashland, uh, from the Oregon Journal of October 31st, 1909. It said, 2,000 sight and pleasure seekers visited the Ashland Mineral Springs Natatorium this evening on October 30th, the occasion being the formal opening of what is said to be the largest plunge bath establishment north of San Francisco. So Ashland, you know, like, like because remember the Lithia Springs Hotel, which is now the Ashland Springs Hotel, when it was built in 1925, was the tallest building between Sacramento and Portland, I think. The Ashland 
you know, had that small town, we can do it uh, better, better and bigger kind of attitude. Um, so uh, uh, back to the, the uh, newspaper. Jordan's orchestra furnished the music for the evening and the large dance pavilion was crowded as was the two mineral swimming pools. The pools are supplied with white sulfur water from springs that bubble up directly under the natatorium. And the utilizing of these famous waters as a source of profit and pleasure on such an extensive scale is an indication that capital is at last taking cognizance of some of Ashland's remarkable resources. <laughs> so, um, and uh, I just let me just mention uh, if because of this. RVML is taping these if you could hold questions till the end, but I th there should be plenty of time for questions or even if you have some additional stories to add. Um, yeah, and um, those springs are still bubbling up water, except they're under the uh, parking lot of the Ashland Food Co-op now. And they are directed to one of the streams um, one of the local streams, yeah, yeah. But Ashland was, when Lithia Park opened in 1916, um, they had three gazebos. One was Lithia water, the, one was white sulfur water, and one was um, soda water. And I have not yet been able to learn what the difference was between the three of them. Someday I'll, fi I'll, I'll find a, uh, someone, you know, some student at SOU who wrote a master's thesis on the three mineral waters of Ashland or something. Um, okay, so, and um, some of you, if any of you are old timers in this room, you will, you may have known those two swimming pools as twin plunges. So the, that building was torn down in 1919. For some reason, it was just not financially successful. But the two big concrete pools remained. In 1931, uh, someone got inspired and fixed them up, you know, resurfaced the concrete, because it, it was probably pitted and everything after 12 years of sitting exposure to the elements. And, um, opened up Twin Plunges, which was a, you know, again, a big two swimming pool outdoor uh, swimming place for until 1977 when it finally closed. Uh, yeah, so we are going, to, we're staying at the natatorium for this story, but this is 1913, the Seiso Jilson wedding, which took place at the natatorium. So again, I'm uh, quoting the Ashland Tidings from September 29, 1913. The, cer the wedding ceremony was witnessed by an immense audience, the building packed to its utmost. The padlock service was used and was conducted by Reverend Dick Campbell. He wore the usual vestments and looked handsome in his part. The bride, Elizabeth Shamlafell, is the little granddaughter of Mrs. Elizabeth Van Sant and is a beautiful girl of six summers. She looked like a lovely doll from Toyland. <laughs> six summers? Okay, you got that, right? Okay. Don't freak out. <laughs> Everyone in the wedding was from four to eight years old. <laughs> And it was the uh, closing, dr the dramatic closing event of the Ashland Children's Festival of 1913. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, see, that's the kind of stuff that they, in addition to swimming, they had the lots of community events there at the natatorium. I have no idea. I haven't, I haven't figured out what a padlock service is yet. <laughs> I guess that it's like the putting of the ball and chain on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay. A humorous, a humorous ball and chain service, perhaps. Huh? So um, 
Let's go to 1927, and so here's the Ashland American newspaper, Rain Deluge Works Havoc. The headline right there is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so how many people were here during the flood of January 1st, 1997? Okay, about a quarter of us maybe. Um, it was, you know, Ashland Creek overflowed, uh, the, 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 the plaza was totally full of water, about a, a foot, foot deep. Um, all the, the basements of all the downtown plaza buildings were filled with water. Um, and we had to use porta potties for two weeks because the water treatment plant <laughs> was knocked out. Uh, but you know, we still had internet, we still had <laughs> automobiles, you know, we still had our, our, our lives were pretty normal other than the people who were cleaning up uh, the mess downtown. However, um, in 1927, it was a different matter. So Ashland Tidings of February 1st 1927 said, the track is impassable for 40 miles between Ashland and Gold Hill. So this is the train tracks. Um, and then in addition, so that's going north and then going south, trains from the south are held up by high water and slides in the Siskiyou Mountains. So back in 1927, um, there were probably a couple hundred people who were stranded here at the Ashland Depot. Um, and uh, the town had to figure out what to do. <laughs> so, and, and Southern Pacific Railroad as well. Well, according to, I came across a, uh, a railroad employee who was interviewed and uh, Maurice Bailey, and he was a, a Southern Pacific employee. He said, Southern Pacific installed radios in each train to provide entertainment for the stranded guests. Um, at this time, Ashland's Depot was three stories high with a dining room, hotel, and offices, so Southern Pacific bedded down all the passengers for free and then hired an orchestra and put on a dance each of the three evenings for the benefit of the passengers. <laughs> so to try to, uh, and then I think the Chamber of Commerce tried to um, get people to walk around town and see if they might want to move here, you know, since they were stuck here for three days. <laughs> um, so that was interesting, but then in the course of researching that, um, some of the old timers in 1927 referred back to the flood of 1890. And they said, oh, you guys, this is nothing. <laughs> That's what old timers do, right? <laughs> Probably a few people in this room uh, talk like that occasionally. OK, they said, this is nothing. Um, and so what they said, according to the Ashland Tidings of February 1927, the floods of the past few days bring back to old timers the days of 1890 when they recounted the days of January and February 1890 when for six weeks this city was without train service, very little mail trickled through and outside news reports were meager. So that, and so no automobiles, right, 1890. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to get somewhere, you got on a horse, right? Or maybe you had a wagon that the horse pulled. Um, mm -hmm. So when they, and no, no, uh, no internet, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, they probably had telegraph and I think phones were maybe just starting to come to Southern Oregon in the 1890s. Um, so six weeks of being cut off, uh, that's what the old timers experience. Okay, um, so those are our stories. I said, I said triumph and tragedy, so 
Max Proct and the natatorium were the triumph. The floods of 27 and 1890 were the tragedies. This one sort of fits in um, in uh, in between everything else. So we'll, we'll we'll call this mystery a bit. So this is Holly Street, and does any do you does anything strike you as slightly unusual about that photo? Like maybe how many cars are parked on Holly Street, which is a very quiet residential street, right? It is bumper to bumper to bumper for blocks, as far as you can see in the photo. Um, why is this, you're probably wondering. And of course, I will tell you. Um, because a healer named Susie Jessel lived at 541 Holly Street. That house, is, house she lived in is still there. It has a little sign on it called the Jessel House. I think it might be a rental now. But um, she healed through laying on of hands. Um, and <clears throat> she didn't take personal credit. She said just God did God's will through, through her, through her hands. Um, so it's hard to express the impact that she had not only on the individual people that she helped heal, but also on the community, the town, the city of Ashland. Um, so the, one of the best ways that I have found that I think helps express it is, so you know, Ashland Shakespeare Festival began in 1935. So in, during the 1940s, it was, uh, there were, maybe a week, one to two weeks of, sh of shows, late, late 40s in the mid, during World War II, it wasn't, it, there were no shows at all. Um, 1950s and 1960s, the a Oregon Shakespeare Festival ran for a month outdoors at the Elizabethan Theater, and the motto was, stay four days, see four plays. Um, so, and it was, you know, they sold out basically that month every year. Um, so think about that and then think about Susie Jessel and bringing people to Ashland to come for healing. She had more of an impact on the restaurants and motels of Ashland during the time she was alive than the Oregon Shakespeare Festival or, or anything else that was going on here in this community. Um, so here's a photo of her um, from 1940 or so. Uh, and according to her daughter, uh, there would, she would have anywhere from 100 to 300 people a night come see her. She would just spend a very short time, a couple minutes with each person. Generally, people would might stay for a week and they'd come every day for a week or every other day for a week. Um, and uh, people came from all over the country to Ashland, Oregon for Susie Jessel. Um, so, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her life. Um, so she was born in 1891. Um, as a breastfeeding infant, she healed pain in her mother's breasts. And that's kind of how her mom, her mom kind of clued in something that was going on. Um, she, when she was an infant, she would touch her father's eyes as he held her, and he had an eye that had been injured in either war or industri you know, industrial accident or something. It healed back to normal. Um, and she described her young life as a 
as an infant and a toddler saying, I can't remember when I wasn't carried at all hours of the night to the ailing. This was in Kentucky, I believe, uh, rural Kentucky. Mother would place my hands on the person, and before long they would get relief from pain. And so my healing career started before I was out of the cradle. Now, of course, most people are pretty skeptical um, about things like laying on of hands healing. Of course, the doctors in the Rogue Valley were very skeptical. Um, and the Susie Jessel, you know, she didn't argue with people, but she, she, she liked to just kind of make a couple of really basic points uh, in regard to, hey, this is all placebo effect, which is, you know, the, the, um, the best argument that one can come up with, you know, because, the, I mean, we do know now from drug tests that people get healed from the placebo <coughs> drugs, right, Occasion, occasionally. Um, but so what, what Susie Jessel said is, um, not only were people who were skeptical who came to her, many of them were healed, um, but also she worked on tiny babies and even animals. And she said, you're not going to have placebo effect with animals or tiny babies. So, you know, um, and, you know, and two of her children also had healing ability. And I, when I wrote about Susie Jessel on my website, I did have a couple people um, tell me, yeah, I went to um, her son Joe, or I went to her daughter Alma, and I was healed. Uh, several you know, people who were in town today. <laughs> um, so she lived, uh, she, she lived in Ashland from 1932 to 1966 and um, just had a, uh, you know, in her own way, had a big, big impact on our town. So now, I promised you stories of hauntings and ghosts. Um, so why do I have a photo of scissors here? Um, so this is a story about a house on Elida Street, took place in a house on Elida Street. Um, and I was told growing up there, you would just have a sense of somebody else hanging out in the house. Um, so the, the person, Julia, who told me this, the front bedroom was my room and things would slide around in that room. I had a couple of friends in high school. We were laughing and giggling in my bedroom um, when, we were, when we were best buddies then. And a pair of scissors on the bureau slid across the bureau. And one of, one of my friends said, I'm not staying in your room again. <laughs> So this was, this was, this was um, viewed by multiple people simultaneously. And, and um, I, you know, I, I occasionally tell stories that are hard to believe, and I try to only do that if I get two or three people giving, giving the, uh, the, the, the story. Um, so, I, you know, I had a hard time believing it myself, so I said, is there any way I could, like, get a photo of those scissors or something? And, and she said, oh, I can show them to you. So she went into another room, brought them back. Those are, like, really heavy brass or steel scissors. And, you know, probably an earthquake. It would take an earthquake to move them, let alone... Uh, um, something else. So that's that's why I, that's why I took the photo of those. But then there was another experience in the house that was um, very different, very weird, and experienced by 
multiple people as well. The moving toilet paper roll. <laughs> okay? So, the toilet paper roll would just spontaneously, on occasion, spontaneously, slowly start to unroll, and then it would start rolling, unrolling faster and faster and faster and faster <laughs> until it pretty much emptied the roll. Several friends experienced this, in addition to the people who lived in the house. So, uh, so here, <laughs> here, this will show you what teenagers do. Um, it got to be, it got to be really mean. She said, "Someone would go into the bathroom, and we would all wait just to see if it would happen." <laughs> Well, I had my best friend who lived in the oldest house on Elida Street across the driveway from us. She went into the bathroom. And I remember my mom and I tiptoeing down the hallway, waiting. And pretty soon my friend screams. And she comes running out of the bathroom sobbing. And it was the toilet paper had started to unroll before she could even get near it to use it. <laughs> so I do not have an explanation, but apparently things like this do happen. Um, and um, so, so. Um, Let's go to the Peerless Hotel. This, this photo is before it was the Peerless Hotel. Um, this is on 4th Street. I'm sure most of you have seen the famous Coca-Cola sign. This, was, this photo was taken in 1990 before it was renovated. So this is a, um, the, it was originally a one-story building in 1900. And, uh, and then in 1904, the, it was expanded and the second floor was added. And it was a rooming house. So there were, I think, eight like little studio, 10 foot by 10 foot bedrooms with one on the second floor with one bathroom that everybody shared. And then downstairs in the back, uh, there were six small rooms with one bathroom that, that people shared. It was a rooming house, peerless rooms. Um, and back then, the railroad district was full of railroad workers and full of people who would come in on the train and stay for a few days. So, you know, it was a lot of s some of the single male railroad workers, rather than buying a house, would stay in a, a room like this, traveling salesmen. Um, women occasionally, um, and uh, there were about eight or ten rooming houses in in the railroad district. It was it was a hop in place for for many years, um, and I have a whole tour about about that. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story about the Peerless Hotel marbles. Those are old antique marbles. You know, not, not the ones you can buy in the store now. Those are uh, early 1900-year-old you know, marbles. Um, and they are the, the secondary stars of the story. Amelia is the main star of the story, but we'll get to her. Um, so the, this story was told to me by Chrissy Donovan, uh, uh, Chrissy Barnett, who is now Chrissy Donovan, who saw the potential. Uh, I mean, it was, it had, um, it had been, uh, actively used up until about 1950 or so. And then it basically was, it wasn't, it may, it may have been abandoned or it may have been, you know, really cheap 
cheap rentals, but when Chrissy Bar uh, Barnett bought it, it it was just uh, you know a total wreck in on the inside. But she put did a two two to three year top to bottom renovation. Of course, it's gorgeous now. Every every room uh, every room is gorgeous, um, and so this was in. Uh, she, 1992 to 1994, she was doing the renovation. Because it's a historic building, she wanted to uh, do the renovation in a way that they could get uh, recognition at the National Register of Historic Places. So she had a historic consultant work with her, and you know you have to be very particular about what not changing too much from from the original look. Um, so, in, I mean, because it was a 1900 house, there really wasn't much of a foundation, or building, there wasn't much of a foundation. So they had to dig down below the floor and kind of work on strengthening the foundation um, to meet the current uh, building codes. The only historic objects that they found when they dug down underneath the floor were, were these marbles. Uh, so, you know, Chrissy was thinking maybe kids had been playing, you know, marbles on the floor and they, you know, the marbles slipped through the cracks in, in the course of, <laughs> in the course of a hundred years. Um, the, um, so, the marbles reappeared in Chrissy's life a few months later in different ways, okay? So there were, I can't remember, oh yeah, so this, this, um, you can, I, it's, it's not as clear as the photo, this is a photo that's on the, on the wall in, in the Peerless Hotel, but look at what I want to point out Look at the baseboard down at the bottom. It's like a eight, an eight to 10 inch baseboard. It's missing. So that's, that's the, the open space on the right um, underneath the wall. That's where the baseboard should be. And um, so you can see into the, into the next room through that space under the wall through the baseboard, right? So Chrissy was by herself uh, at the end of the work day one day, um, alone, in, alone in the building, or she, uh, she believed she was alone in the building, walking through the downstairs rooms, and then she suddenly perked up because she heard the sound of a marble rolling in the next room. So she kind of looked under and she saw a marble rolling along the floor through that opening under the baseboard. So she said, somebody, you know, somebody else must, one of the work guys must be here. So she walked around into the next room. No person, no marble. Okay, there's, there's mystery number one, just an empty room. So then her second encounter with the spirit, or what you want to call it, she had hired, the, I mentioned she had hired a historic consultant um, to help with making sure that they dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's and um, made it uh, so that it would actually, you know, with all the extra work, so it would actually meet the standards of being a historic, registered as a historic building. So, she, you know, she was, Happy to do it, but it was frustrating. And uh, if any of you have worked on historic buildings, um, you probably can relate to that. So one day, towards the end of the renovation process, she and the consultant were talking in one of the upstairs rooms and um, kind of wrapping things up. And and he he said to her. You know, we've really done a great job, but I can't guarantee that the National Register people are going to approve the building. And she got, what? 
after all of this that we, <laughs> that we went through. So she just felt all of this anger exploding inside her. You know, she followed every, everything he said to do. She did it. And, and uh, now, he, now he tells her, well, maybe, you know, maybe it won't be good enough. And so in that moment of, of anger and just this crackling of, uh, of tension between the two of them, both she and the consultant heard this loud crack right at their feet as if someone had thrown a heavy object like a an old, heavy old marble right down there on the floor. And they looked down and, you know, there was nothing there, it was just, just the sound. But that snapped them out of the tension that had been there between them. Um, and um, she was, again, mystified. It's interesting, um, I'm going to be, I've been working for the last year or so on developing a haunted Ashland walking tour. Uh, Nikki mentioned I have, I have walking tours, I actually have nine different walking tours, but I'm going to be, hopefully next month in by mid to late June, I'll be starting to offer a haunted Ashland walking tour, and I'm going to, include in that um, I've spoken with the current owners. Uh, Chrissy sold the Peerless Hotel a couple years ago to some new owners. Um, and I've spoken with them and they have had some similar kinds of experiences to what I just expressed happened between Chrissy and that her historic consultant. Um, so, okay, so let's go now to 1994, uh, the renovation was complete. She was getting ready to start having, you know, people booking rooms. She had an open house for the community. Um, and uh, this is an all day open house. People could, you know, because people were curious. They'd been watching her work on this for two years, you know. Um, and uh, so during, during the afternoon, she, Chrissy had noticed uh, an elderly, white-haired woman who was spending a lot of time sort of in the upstairs rooms and wandering around. And towards the end of the open house, this elderly woman approached Chrissy privately, and she said, she said to Chrissy, do you know that you have a friend? And as Chrissy explained it to me, she said, I, I was kind of confused. And I said, well, I hope I have a lot of friends. Um, and the woman kind of laughed. And she said, no, what I mean is you have a friend here in the Peerless. And her name is Amelia. She is a spirit here. And she told me she is very happy with what you have done with the building. So the elderly woman went on to tell Chrissy that Amelia had lived in the peerless rooms for some period of time, many decades before, um, when it was a boarding house. And um, yeah, that's, that's uh, it's fascinating that um, there are these you know, some people have sort of the the the, mis the mysterious experience, the way Chrissy was describing, and then some people kind of have uh, a way to tap into what the cause is of the uh, maybe you know what is the cause of the mysterious experience, like this woman who said that she communicated with Amelia. Um, so. Uh, I'll have lots more of those stories to tell, actually. Um, but um, OK, we, we, will, we will wrap it up here with some more humor from 19, OK, that's, that's my business card. More, more humor from the uh, 1929 high school newspaper. Um, 
Dwayne says, do you think my voice would fill the assembly? Tuman replies, no, it would probably empty it. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the last one, Leverett asks this question to his dad. Did Mr. Edison make the first talking machine, Pa? And Pa replies, no, my son. God made the first talking machine, but Edison made the first one that could be shut off. <laughs> uh, so. I don't know. They had they had some good. They had a few a few good ones. Um, so, yeah, I would love to have questions. I would love to have people add some some s stories if if you have a story. I'll just mention um, in terms of the way that I'm trying to kind of number one, have fun, and number two, serve the people of Ashland, help build community here. Number one is the website. So I, I just celebrated the fifth anniversary of the Walk Ashland website. Um, started in April 2018. And there are now, they're all photos and stories. So photos and text. There are more than 130 photo essays on the website uh, some with 10, 20, 30 photos. Uh, a lot about Ashland history, a lot about art in Ashland, both our public art collection and neighborhood art. Um, a lot about, I'm writing about the Ashland tree of the year for each year since 1988. S holidays, you know, Halloween photos, 4th of July photos. Um, mystery. mystery, well, okay, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and, um, and, then, uh, and then how it started was I was walking around my neighborhood and I started taking photos of houses and flowers and gardens. And I thought, oh, this would be fun to share with people. So eventually I will have photos and stories about every street in Ashland. Uh, on the website. So it's a monster. <laughs> so, but that led to me doing walking tours, which I started doing regularly last summer. And there's a page on the website that says walking tours, and that can take you to a calendar. I usually fill up the calendar one month in advance during, uh, dur during the summer, summer and fall, spring, summer, and fall months. Um, I speak to community groups, if anyone, you know, similar to this. I've spoken with Ollie and uh, Senior Center, Mountain Meadows, Rotary Club. If anybody's part of a community group, I'm happy to, to share some stories or, or history. Um, and, um, and then I have a... a Twice, twice a week, I send out an email newsletter. It's just two or three photos. And you can grab a card on the way out or, or, or f from me if you want to just sign up to, to get an email every Monday and Thursday with two or three photos. Um, and uh, as Alice said, I send out a, a mystery photo once a week usually and say, where is this? And try to see who can who can guess where it is. So, well, thank you very much. And um, let's open it up to if there are questions or, or comments. And what house was that with the scissors moving? Where is that house? On Elida Street, oh. 92 Elida Street. Where's Elida Street? Um, Elida Street is off of East Main. It's just like. Two blocks. One, one or two, yeah, two blocks Between long. East Main and Siskiyou. No. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Did they say there's like a, a missing, you know, murder or something, or, or just no, no, no clue, no clue. Yeah. Uh, just just seamstress. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, uh, that's uh, 
Yes. Uh, last time we spoke, Peter, I mentioned Tunnel 13 to you, which is fascinating. It's not quite in Ashland, but it's so close. Mm -hmm. It's also, strictly speaking, illegal to go up there. So it would put you in a quandary, but <laughs> have you thought about doing something on Tunnel 13? Uh, I, I I am... I'm just going to take me the rest of my life, Tom, just to, <laughs> just to do Ashland. I, I am not even, I'm not even writing about a mile outside of Ashland, let alone. T Tunnel 13 is the last great train robbery in the United States, 1913, I think. 19... 20s, I think. 1920s. Um, there were some... The D'Entremont brothers had this cockamamie idea <laughs> to um, rob the train where they thought, which a train they thought was carrying a lot of gold in the mail car. So they planted a bomb in the mail car, blew up the mail car, and killed killed two or three railroad employees, which is what really got them in trouble because then, you know, they were wanted for murder. But they blew up whatever was in there. They, they blew it up anyway. Um, and they actually did, they got away. Uh, they got away uh, and they, it took, one of them was tracked down after two or three years, I think maybe, or maybe two or three months, and another one took a few years before he was tracked down, but they both ended up in, in prison uh, for, for murder. Yeah, yeah, but it was, and it took place right as the train was coming out of Tunnel 13 up in the Siskiyou Mountains. That's what Tom was asking about. Yeah, not Tunnel 13. We think that that famous scene in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid was based, may have been based on that. Oh, uh, Butch Cassidy scene may have been yeah. based on, yeah, on the Don Tremo brothers. Okay. Yeah, Gil. Peter, have you done anything or researched out the enclosed swimming pool down by my house on Randy that is like 50, 60 years old but still? So, yeah, that's private, but still right. Running. Right. So, okay. So, you're, uh, Gil's asking about the hel the Hellman baths, um, which is an, another mineral spring that was, um, you know, where the waters bubbled up, and uh, the story was that it had been a Native American healing place before before the pioneers got here. And then um, Hellman, who owned the uh, downtown area, owned property all the way about that far, obviously. Um, and so Randy, this is near Hellman School. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of his kids, I believe it was, opened up a spa there. Um, and it, it was there probably at least 50 years. I think it closed in 1956. So it was there for a long time. It still functions. From, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I have, I, I, it's on my, whoop. <laughs> oh, there, <laughs> self <laughs> 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 nope. I did it, I did it. <laughs> uh, it, uh, but yeah, I think it was from, the late 1800s through the 1956. So there were uh, the natatorium, the Hellman baths, which I'm hoping to be able to get in and take photos and and tell the full story of that. Um, and then the, you know the Jackson Hot Springs, which is the only one that's left today, which is now the Jackson Well Springs, um, just on the north end of town where you can still take the waters. <laughs> yes? I went in the Hellman uh, pool one time because um, I always wanted to know what was going on, but you couldn't see and you know, I would walk by there all the time. It's near where I live. And uh, anyway, there were these uh, Mexican fellows 
working on it and stuff. And I said, could I come in, please? Let me come in. Mm -hmm. Okay, lady, come in. You know, so I got to come in and check it out. And it's in great shape. You know, I mean, it looks great. Well, that's that's encouraging. So, um, the the Hellman pool, the bath pool, is still in excellent condition. It it is, it is covered by a, you know a, a building that's in good condition. So is it privately owned. Privately yeah. owned, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but did, did the water smell like mineral water? Do you remember? Uh, I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, back in the early 1900s, the Chamber of Commerce of Ashland built a lithia water tasting gazebo at the train station with, of course, the, the idea was that people who were taking the, you know, Ashland was a one half hour train stop for every train that went between Portland and San Francisco. And during the heyday, there were five, four or five passenger trains each day going north and south. Um, so the idea was during that half hour, people you know, piled out of the train, got something to eat. Let's have them try the, the, the healing mineral water, and then they'll want to stay, or they'll want to move here, or they'll want to come back. How many people have had the lithia water and that made them want to want to stay want to stay <laughs> okay we I, I i drink it i drink it every time i walk through the plaza but i do not take uh bottles of it home with me to drink no, however. but speaking of that why did they take the water from, it's like the gun range or something, is where that water comes from, right? Mm -hmm. And they pipe it over the plaza. What, what was the impetus for that, do you know? To, because the... the, the water, there's no spring closer? Uh, not lithia water. There was the white sulfur water bubbling up, I guess, all over town, but uh, whatever, whatever that difference is. But lithia, you know, lithium is a brain healing nutrient um, and not, not that anybody knew that specifically at the time, but, um, you know, it, it was the business boosters who thought that a Ashland could become the Saratoga Springs of the Northwest. There would be ca uh, healing spas built here and casinos and um, people would, you know, come from all over for the for the, the lithia water. That was, that was the dream, but the dream, that dream did not manifest. But <laughs> was the bottling plant, what water was that? It's in Lithia Park? Um, the, all that's left of it is. The yeah, park. there's some stairways up. When, when you take the path, he, he's asking about the bottling plant in Lithia Park. Uh, when you take the path up the left going south through Lithia Park from, from the plaza. Uh, there's some stairs that go up a steep hill to the left, maybe half a mile up the path. And there was a, uh, this is a little square building at the top of, of those stairs. And what the, the reason for that was, my understanding anyway, is that the, uh, all three types of mineral water were piped to there. And then when Lithia Park opened in 1916, remember I mentioned there were three gazebos at the time, one for each kind of mineral water. And so the water was sent out around Lithia Park from that plant. Um, now bottling was done at the Lithia Springs themselves. There were, there were people who had business, uh, businesses selling lithia water in glass bottles. Um, but I don't think they've sold very much. <laughs> I think there was a lithia fountain, too, in front of the library. Yeah. No. That is correct. Right. That's that uh, statue of the sort of the woman 
in front of the on, on the on the corner of the library at Gresham and Siskiyou. Um, there were four drinking fountains, and two were regular water and two were lithia water. Yeah, yes. I have a little anecdote about that. I work in the Plaza Information booth in the summertime. It is the most fun to watch people come across that plaza and try out the water. <laughs> and of course, there's the fresh water, and then there's yeah. the lithia water. And kids, middle school kids especially, and a few summers ago, I guess be before COVID, um, middle school, a group of middle school kids came through, and they were challenging each other to see how long they could drink. <laughs> and I watched, and I started to time, and these kids were just gulping and gulping it, and I hope they didn't get sick, because it could be too much of a good thing. Yeah. 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 That's right. Uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, just an anecdote. Um, my grandfather was born here in 1889, and uh, he would sit down there like that at the <laughs> plaza, and people would come and drink it and then spit it out. And he says, "No, it's good for you. It's really good for you. Look at me. When I came here, I couldn't walk, and look at me now." <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> He hadn't aged a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would have been a joke for the 1929. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thank you, everybody. This is great.